Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin our study, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence here. You know the needs that each of us have, you know, our families, our loved ones, uh, our friends, the people that we come in contact with, and the people that are upon our hearts. Uh, we ask that you can be with them today. We ask for your Holy Spirit to reveal to us our need of you and to uh, show your mercy, grace, and power in our lives. We ask that as we continue this study, um, as we look at uh, the paper by David H. Thiel, that we can have a clear understanding. We pray for him, and uh, we pray for all who are searching for truth, watching these videos. We ask, Lord, that your spirit can work in their lives in a powerful way. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So yesterday, we were looking at uh, what Theo was saying about James White and uh, Weir. So this is a critique of Weir, but it's also a critique of James White, which which I find kind of odd that, uh, the, you know, because usually what people try to do in, is, well, they try not to be critical of James White. <laughs> now, um, so we're going to be looking at, at what James White says. I, I'm not sure if we're going to get all the way to what Ellen White says about the, you know, the Eastern question and so on. Uh, but we had sort of finished off with this, this uh, statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, which we're, we're all familiar with. This is... Um, from uh, Selected Messages, books, book two, page 109, right? So this, this statement, I'm going to, we'll, we'll start here and we'll just continue sort of reading over where we had already read. Um, all that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Now, when we take this set, this sentence here, it just says that we're in the stream of, of prophecy. Some is been fulfilled and, and some is unfulfilled and it comes in its order, right? Now we know that, that Thiel's going to modify this statement. He's going to interpret it differently than, than I would take it. A Daniel, God's prophet stands in his place. John stands in his place. And in the revelation, the line of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy, the book of Daniel. And thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events, which we must know as we stand in the very threshold of their fulfillment. Now, we, we know that this is a commentary on Daniel standing in his lot, right? Daniel standing in his lot or in his place. And this has to do with the understanding of the book of Daniel. So Daniel stands in his lot or stands in his place. How? How does Daniel stand in his lot or in his place? What What is Ellen White saying about that? What does that mean? But go thy way till the end be, for thy, thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So how is Ellen White applying that Daniel standing in his lot? Anyone? Nobody wants to answer that question? Or nobody knows the answer? I can guess at it. Okay. I'm assuming it's talking about him, his uh, prophecy um, standing in the lot in the last days. Right. So it, it is. it has to do with his prophecies of the time in which they are fulfilled, right? So if he's going to stand in his lot at the end of the days, that is at the end of the 1290 days, right? In that period between the 1290 and the 1335 that are mentioned in verse 11 and 12, in verse 13, it says, go thy way for thou shalt stand in the lot at the end of the days. Means really at the period of time there in between uh, 1798 and 1844. That's where he stands in his lot. But of course, his prophecies were fulfilled in that period, right? He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events, which must we must know as we stand in the very threshold of their fulfillment. So we can see that there's 
their fulfillment there, right, in Millerite history. But we are at the time of the end. So we are in the time in which Daniel's prophecies are being fulfilled, even though, you know, we're past 1844. So it's it's at that period where his prophecies are opened up, right? So now we understand his prophecies. But there are some things that are still not fulfilled, right? So even though those prophetic periods come to an end, there are still things that are are to be fulfilled. That which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. So in history and prophecy, the word of God portrays the long continued conflict between truth and error. The conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived and new theories will be continually arising. But God's people who in their belief and fulfillment of prophecy have acted a part in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages know where they stand. They have an experience that is more precious than fine gold. They are, are to stand firm as a rock, holding the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end. Now, Theo's going to interpret this in a way that I, I wouldn't see that it would be naturally understood. Okay, so he says, with the assurance that all prophecy that remains unfulfilled will be fulfilled in its proper order, we can persevere through troubling controversies, whether they be revived or new. So at this juncture, we may proceed with the objections raised, first by James White and then by Lewis Weir, regarding the fulfillment of Daniel 11 by the Ottoman Empire, that is Turkey, right? So he's he's trying to take this that, so some prophecies that haven't appeared to be fulfilled are going to be fulfilled, right? So he's using it as some kind of assurance that this delay, so so to speak, in the Ottoman Empire fulfilling this prophecy of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, or 36 to 45, is, is, um, is still going to happen. That's how he's interpreting this statement. Okay, so he says, James White lays the groundwork for future doubts by those who would look to circumstances that appear overwhelmingly impossible to finite minds and feel that what has been presented as fulfilled prophecy had turned to rot and worms and therefore must be a false interpretation. Now, we don't find this in in anything that James White says. He doesn't make that argument. So this is some words that are being put into James White's mouth or thoughts being put into James White's head by Theo. But we know that James White doesn't make that argument at all, right? So it's, it's, it's something that's being imposed upon James White, right? He does this by using a line of reasoning that takes an extreme conclusion, forcing it upon the beliefs of those who would never accept such rationale. Here are the key paragraphs conveying White's main thrusts um, for overturning the conclusions of that group of Sabbath school participants used by Uriah Smith and Daniel in the Revelation. So you, you can see here, and, and as I said in the end of the study yesterday, you know, it's highly polemical language. There's just all kinds of emotionally loaded verbiage, right? And, uh, which, which I don't think it has its proper place. I don't think it's the best way uh, to deal with trying to convince somebody of something. Yeah, you're sort of manipulating them, in my view. Okay, so this is James White. He says, let us take a brief view of the line of prophecy four times spanned in the book of Daniel. It will be admitted that the same ground is passed over in chapters 2, 7, 8, and 11 with this exception that Babylon is left out of chapters 8 and 11. We first pass down the great image of chapter 2, where Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome are represented by the gold, silver, the brass, and the iron. All agree that these feet are not Turkish, but Roman. And as we pass down the lion, the bear, the leopard, the beast with ten horns, representing the same as the great image, again all will agree that it is not Turkey that is cast into the burning flame, but the Roman beast. So chapter eight, all agree that the little horn that stood up against the prince of princes is not Turkey, but Rome. In all these three lines thus far, Rome is the last form of the government mentioned. 
Now, this is taken from uh, Unfulfilled Prophecy, Review and Herald, November 29th, 1877. So this is going to be um, about five years after these Review and Herald articles had been published by Uriah Smith. Right after they, um, that is the ones dealing with, with Daniel. Okay, so there's Revelation is first and then Daniel, thoughts on Daniel. And so this is about five years later. Okay, that makes sense. And then, and the, the other statement that we're going to have is going to be, uh, in 1878, uh, from where are we? So that's another James White article. And there is a line of historic prophecy in chapter 11 where the symbols are thrown off, beginning with the kings of Persia and reaching down past Grisha and Rome to the time when that power shall come to his end and none shall help him. If the feet and the ten toes of the metallic image are Roman, if the beast with ten horns that was given to the burning flames of the great day be the Roman beast, if the little horn which stood up against the prince of princes be Rome, and if the same field and distance are covered by these four prophetic chains, then the last power of the 11th chapter, which is to come to his end, none shall help him, is Rome. But if this be Turkey, as some teach, then the toes of the image of the second chapter are Turkish. And the beast with ten horns of the seventh chapter represents Turkey. And it was Turkey that stood up against the prince of princes of the eighth chapter of Daniel. True, Turkey is bad enough off. But its waning power and its end is the subject of the prophecy of John and not of Daniel. Right. So that's the position that we have taken. We would agree with James White. We would agree with his logic. Now, we're going to look at how uh, David H. Thiel addresses this. He says, we can agree that, as the different visions were given to Daniel, each vision had its own independent interpretation. So I'm not really sure each has its own independent interpretation. That is, they are codependent interpretations, but anyway. Daniel 2 reveals a mysterious and at first forgotten metallic image resembling a man. The interpretation is given in the same chapter as Daniel reveals as God reveals to Daniel what Nebuchadnezzar has, had initially forgotten. And let us, just for the sake of dwelling on details, remember that we do not see a little toe grow to uproot three other toes. Right. So it is not germane to the information we paid at this time, and yet it brings a potential paradigm shift to our understanding of how additional details are added in future visions given to Daniel and John, as we shall consider how the sum of the visions informs our understanding of any single vision right, considered independently of the others. So he, he's making a point here that he's trying to say that each vision has, it's, it's a repeat and enlarge, and it's, it's going to add more details, right, which we would agree. It helps us to understand that the details of one vision are not necessarily provided to expand understanding of previous prophecies, but to make us aware of which historical events are applicable to the character actors involved in fulfilling prophecy. We may safely conclude that the ten toes of the metallic image do not necessarily translate to the very same ten kingdoms that existed at the time the little horn emerges at the expense of three kingdoms so so we've got the ten toes and we have uh, the ten horns and there's going to be uh, uh, the three that are going to be uprooted right and now do we agree they're not the same so when we look at the ten toes, the ten divisions of Rome, and we look at the ten horns of Daniel 7, what is he saying here? Are they the same ten kingdoms? From what I'm reading, I would have to say that that seems to be the position he's taking. Well, he's taking a position that they're not. Okay. They do not necessarily translate into the very same ten kingdoms. All right. What do we say? Do we say that the ten toes of the image are the same as the ten kingdoms in, in Daniel 7. I always thought they were representative of each other, one being with the pagans and one being with papal. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't... Well, well, we have um, the little horn. So the papal is not really represented in the image of Daniel 2, right? I mean, we, we see... We see Rome, and we see the miry clay, so we see the division of Rome, and we see the stone coming 
So in Daniel 2, we're given the destruction of, of the final kingdom, which is Rome in its, in its fractured state, which is the time in which we live. But there are, there's details in Daniel chapter 7 regarding those 10 divisions that three are going to be plucked up, right? So you're going to have the papacy really for the first time represented in Daniel 7. It's not represented in Daniel 2. But they're, they're still the same 10. That's my understanding of it. But he says they don't necessarily translate in the very same 10 kingdoms. I don't know if I would agree with that. But definitely there are more details being added, right? So only Daniel 7 and 8 mention little horns that wax great. In chapter 7, the little horn represents papal Rome. But in Daniel 8, the little horn represents pagan Rome. Well, that's not quite true. The little horn in Daniel 8 represents both pagan and papal Rome. So I'm not sure how he he says this. So I'm not really sure where, where he gets this idea, but maybe he's just sticking to what Uriah Smith says. But I don't think Uriah Smith says it's just pagan Rome. Uh, furthermore, the interpretation for chapter 7's vision is given in the same chapter. But the explanation for vision 8, Daniel 8, is, is given in following visions recorded in chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. Now, again, this isn't really technically true. Is the explanation for Daniel 8 given in Daniel 8? No. Yeah, it is. Is it? Yeah, the rest of Daniel 8 interprets the vision just as he does in chapter 7. Then why, why, why is it said in Daniel 9, I have come to show thee the vision, the understanding? Because, oh, because he's going to give him more details. Okay. Right. So there's parts of the vision he doesn't understand. What he doesn't understand is the timeline, right? So the start of the vision, he doesn't understand exactly where the 2300 days begins. So in Daniel 9, he's going to be given the start of the 2300 days. And and when you think about it, too, he's brought into the future. So in Daniel chapter 8, he'd been brought into the future. He'd been brought into the time of the Medo-Persia, even though he's living in the time of Babylon. So in Daniel chapter 9, he's going to be given that part of the explanation, the starting point. And why? So because we know in chapter 8, he doesn't fully understand it. 19 years later, he's going to be given uh, the starting point which is still going to be future from his time, right? I mean, it's going to be 457. Okay, but we do agree that chapter 9, 10, 11, and 12 expand upon the understanding of the prophetic periods. Now, in da after Daniel 9, we know that Daniel is going to understand the 70 weeks, right? That is the matter, right, for, for the decree or the thing, whatever you want to call it. It's the Dabar. He understands that. Um, and he also understands the Mareh, the 2300 days. What he doesn't understand is the Kazon, right? That is, he's given an understanding in Daniel chapter 9 of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. They both start together. But he still doesn't understand the Kazon, the 2520, particularly even the prophetic mirror. And so we can see why in Daniel 10, 11, and 12, uh, the whole issue has to be with the 2520 itself, right? That's what we came to understand. Now, of course, David H. Field doesn't know that. Right? He doesn't believe in the 2520. He doesn't understand that. So different details are given in chapter 11 than those given in chapter 7, right? So we all agree with that. There's more details. So we can understand that the information given is just as different for us to comprehend as the 10 horns of chapter 7 uh, are different than the 10 toes of chapter 2, which I don't agree with. But <laughs> anyway, so we're, we're going to look at how he, he does this. James White attempted to make the case that the information is expansive on previous explanations. No new players are introduced. Now, we would agree with James White, right? To introduce Turkey as the kingdom that is going to be the final kingdom would be completely inconsistent with the idea that Rome is the final kingdom. Now, to say no new players are introduced, I guess no 
obviously there's details that are added, but you wouldn't replace Rome with Turkey. Now, then Thiel goes on, he says, therefore, he ridicules the idea that Turkey could be the king of the north by his absurd conclusion that if Turkey is the king of the north during the time period covered in Daniel 11, 36 to 45, then Turkey is also the beast of the Daniel, of Daniel the seventh and the iron legs of Daniel the second. Right now, of course, you know, he's using language here, ridicules and um, absurd. Right. So he's using all of these type, this type of, of language. And and I don't know if James White, I would say that he's ridiculing. He's just showing the inconsistency that if you have Turkey, then you would also have to have Turkey all along the way, right? To show how inconsistent this reasoning is, so he's trying to say that this, this reasoning is inconsistent. We can deduce that if Turkey must be the legs or the fourth beast, in order to be king of the north in verse 36 and 45, then Turkey would also be the king of the north through all of Daniel 11. Such an objection is simply unreasonable. If we were to take the same logic and apply it to how we ought to understand the unfolding events connected to the seven trumpets of Revelation chapter 8 and 9, then the first two and three woes could not possibly be connected to the Turkish Muslims. Okay, so just let that sort of think <laughs> think in sink in as you think about it so he's he's trying to say so the seven trumpets of revelation of chapters eight and nine then the first two and three the first two of three woes could not be connected to the turkish muslims okay so what is his reasoning here what was the problem with the reasoning what is the subject of uh, Revelation 8 and 9. What What is the subject? It is the fall of Revelation 8 and 9. Revelation 8 is the fall of, we'll just look at it that way, Western Rome, right? And Revelation 9 is the fall of Eastern Rome. Is Revelation 8 and 9 about Rome? I appreciate I thought, that. I get that one to get done. Huh? I thought um, 9 was um, had to do with Islam. Islam is the one that brings about the fall of Eastern Rome. Okay. Right? right? So, right, you. so it's not really about Islam. Right? It's about the fall of Eastern Rome. So it, it's about Rome. Right? Just as chapter 8 is. Now, it's going to be uh, the Germanic tribes that bring about the fall of Western Rome in chapter 8. And Islam bringing about the fall of Eastern Rome in chapter 9. OK, so it's still about Rome. Now, if we're now we know that Rome is the king of the north and and Uriah Smith. Does Uriah Smith have pagan Rome and papal Rome as the king of the north? Prior to Daniel 11, verse 36. Right. So in Daniel 11, verse 36, Uriah Smith is going to say that a new power here is introduced, France, the if it says a king, then we can say a king shall do according to his will of be introducing a new power, which he says is France, which is an atheistic power. But does he have Rome before that? Does Rome conquer Syria? Does Rome become the king of the north? Just look at it here. Because we've gone through this. So when we look at Daniel chapter 11, um, and we look at... Uh, well, let's hear, um, you know, Daniel 11, verse 33 in Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel, right? A long period of papal persecution against those who were struggling to maintain the truth and instruct their fellow men in ways of righteousness is here brought to view, right? Uh, this period is called a time, a time, a dividing of times, a time, times and a half, a thousand, two hundred, three score days and 42 months. All these expressions are various ways of denoting the same 1260 years of papal supremacy. So Uriah Smith's going to have Rome here, right? We would agree. And he's going to have papal Rome. So we're going to, we're going to have the Battle of Paneum, which he doesn't mention by name, but we're going to have the Battle of Paneum. Uh, we're going to have, uh, and then we're going to have Rome come in 
it's going to to conquer this territory and and then we're going to have the papacy right and so when it says in verse 36 and the king shall do according to his will it's describing the characteristic of this persecutory power right the difference is that uriah smith says no that's not describing the power that was just mentioned it's it's actually going to be describing a new power and this new power is going to be the power that's going to take it's going to be the power that takes the pope captive and this power then so this is how uriah smith sees it at the time of the end there's a characteristic this power has that is is well it's characterized by egypt coming against him pushing at him and Turkey coming against him like a whirlwind. So, so France, this power that's going to take the Pope captive at the time of the end in 1798 is also going to have this, this battle against it, right? From, from Egypt and from, from Turkey. Well, Egypt and Syria and Turkey. So, um, and then he's going to take this, these verses, verse 41 to 45 talking about how Turkey is going to come in and basically set up its uh, palaces in Jerusalem, right? So that that's just a simple way in, in understanding how Uriah Smith sees this. Now, is if we're, we're going to look at the, the power that comes to his end and none shall help, is that more consistent to have to do with the fall of modern Rome, right? The papacy revived or Turkey, right? This is where James White is saying this isn't consistent with the, with, with the fall of, because this is dealing with the fall of this power that isn't a major biblical power, right? James White says that this is the topic of revelation where you have Islam, but Islam is a power that comes in to bring about the fall of Eastern Rome. It doesn't have its place here in Daniel chapter 11. Does that make sense? That that's the difference between what James White is saying about Daniel 11 and what Uriah Smith is saying. So hopefully that's clear. So this, this argument that uh, Theo makes isn't, isn't actually a, it's not really a good argument because he's he's arguing something quite different than what James White is arguing, right? You wouldn't take this logic and say no, that um, because in James White he has Rome there, right? And because Revelation eight and nine are about Rome, so you you wouldn't say well, um, and of course the two and, and it's really. Revelation 9, because in Revelation chapter 8, there isn't the first woe. It's in chapter 9. So the, the, the two woes are obviously connected to uh, Islam, right? To the Ottoman Empire. It, it, it's not inconsistent. It, it, you kind of see, hopefully you can see sort of the, the logic and reasoning that Theo is using. Because we can say, James White can say, we have a place for Islam in the book of Revelation in taking down Eastern Rome. We don't have a place for it in Daniel chapter 11. That it's James White is being consistent. He's not being inconsistent. And so to say that his James White's objection is unreasonable is unreasonable because it's not the same logic, right? There, there, He's comparing apples and oranges. You see what I'm saying? Anybody have questions about it or is it clear? You know, because we may not have thought about this before and how this, this relates. But James White is saying we have Rome. It's not inconsistent to recognize that we have Islam taking down Eastern Rome in Revelation. But it would be inconsistent to have Islam being the kingdom that's going to come to its end because the kingdom that comes to its end, the kingdoms that we're concerned about in Bible prophecy, Rome is a kingdom we're concerned about. We're not concerned about Islam. 
Islam coming to its end with none to help it wouldn't it, 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 it's not important in that context. So, there, so there's nothing inconsistent with James White's logic. The fact that in Revelation we have Islam is consistent with the idea that we don't have Islam in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. So hopefully, you know, I didn't get any feedback there, so I don't know if you guys understand it or not. Okay, it is not enough to push a scarecrow down by creating a row of straw men to fall like dominoes, as James White did. Okay, I have no idea what that sentence means. <laughs> it's, <clears throat> unfortunately, I would have to almost call that a word salad. Well, it's, it's some kind of mixed metaphor. <laughs> well, I mean... I, I mean, I, I shouldn't... The, the thing is... You know, it, it's maybe not fair, but I just don't know what that is supposed to say. That, that's all I'm saying. I looked at the sentence before and I was like, push a scarecrow down by creating a row of straw men to fall like dominoes. I'm not sure what that, that means. I mean, how what this metaphor is trying to illustrate. But it, it probably makes sense to him. So we'll just leave that sentence aside. But uh, uh, well, his his following statement, we must be willing to see history unfold in such a manner that Daniel could be cryptically referring to two different powers that result from the religio political intrigues of the pagan Roman creature that contorts and divides into two regions. What's he trying to say in this portion? Okay. Okay, so we must be willing to see history unfold in such a manner that Daniel could be, we'll just say, referring to two different powers that result from religious political intrigues of the Roman creature. So that's the Roman Empire that divides into two regions. So it becomes Eastern and Western Rome, where one becomes the seat of the beast, Rome, while the other remains the king of the north. Constantinople, Istanbul, Byzantinian, uh, by the very prediction that Daniel records in chapter, chapter 11, verse 24. So okay, hold. he's, what's that? I said hold. Okay, yeah. One of the points that you kind of skipped over. Okay. As he wrote this, he's making this, this statement that Daniel could be cryptically referring to two different powers that result from the religio political intrigues of the pagan Roman creature that contorts and divides into two regions. Mm -hmm. Now, he's trying to make this point that it twists and then divides into Western and region. Western and, yeah. Okay, Western and Eastern where one becomes the seat of the beast. So he's trying to say that the beast is existing at, and that the beast is different and separate from the king of the north. Right, right. So he's got the beast and the king of the north, these two different powers. So, I mean, it's it's a difficult to trying to wrap my mind around this. So, So the basic idea is that Rome... We have Eastern and Western Rome, and somehow Eastern Rome becomes the king of the north when it's conquered by Islam. Is that kind of what he's saying? I would think so. Okay. Now, so he's going to have, so he's going to introduce the king of the north. So I'm just trying to understand his thinking. So he has, we have Rome. It divides into Eastern and Western Rome. Now, Western Rome is going to be conquered by um, these Germanic tribes, right? Okay. And it's going to become Papal Rome, right? The Western Roman Empire becomes, you know, Ro Roman Catholic. Okay. And then he's saying this other part of pagan Rome is going to be conquered by Islam eventually, right? It is Eastern Rome is going to become Islam. 
right? And, and Turkey is going to be the principal country that we recognize as conquering that. Okay, so it's going to be the territory of Turkey. And it becomes the king of the north. Or he says, remains the king of the north. So that when, when Rome, when pagan Rome conquers that territory, it becomes part of the Roman Empire. Pagan Rome is the king of the north at that time. But then Rome falls. Western Rome becomes the beast. And Eastern Rome retains this character as being the king of the north. So that's what he's saying. Okay. That, that makes sense that that's what he's saying. All right. Okay. I think that that must be what he's saying. So he says that, you know, James, so going back to his first sentence, James White created a row of straw men, but he pushed down a scarecrow. So the scarecrow would be um, his view that we can't, um, you know, that we, that, that it's dangerous sort of to speculate about unfulfilled prophecy, maybe. And he pushes that down, but somehow by creating a row of straw men to fall like dominoes, as James White did. So, I mean, Thiel would do a better job if he had if he had written this in plainer language and more straightforward way, and and not so polemical, right? I mean, if he explained, here is what I think how we should understand this prophecy, and if he had done it in that way, one is it'd be easier to evaluate his his ideas, but. But we, we I think for the first time we get his idea here on how he understands this, and uh, at least I think I understand it now. After all, no emperor before Constantine had thought to become a Christian, though members of Caesar's household had done so, done so. Nor had any emperor prior to that time moved the capital of Rome over one thousand miles, seventeen hundred uh, kilometers away. Only for a short time of about 60 years did Ravenna serve as a capital of the West, but then it to be brought back to Rome under the popes of the Holy See. Okay. Now, I'm not sure how that relates. Uh, that sort of seems kind of out of place. So there's some, some logic or reasoning here that he, like, like he says, after all, no emperor before Constantine had been thought to become a Christian, though members of Caesar's household had done so, nor had any emperor prior to the time moved the capital of Rome for 1,000 miles away. Only a short time of about 60 years did Ravenna serve as capital of the West, but then to be brought back to Rome under the Pope's and so, so does anybody understand how this last part of this paragraph relates to what he says in the first part? I don't think I follow it. It's not logical. Okay. It, it doesn't seem like after all, it doesn't follow as after all. Okay. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand it. So, I mean, that could be a problem on my part. It could be a, partly a problem on his part on communicating what he means. But but I, I don't see it following. Like it doesn't seem to connect. So he says, if we for a moment believe that the prediction of Josiah Lich is correct in calculating the loss of Byzantine authority at the beginning of the second world, then we should look for a fall by warfare or a submission by entreaty to mark the commencement of the devise of the devise of Eastern Rome in AD 1449 upon the death of Emperor John the Eighth Peleologos. What? Okay. There were no truly uncontested successors to assume the role of Roman of Roman held lands under the domain of Constantinople because John had no children. One of his brothers, Constantine uh, Dracozis, Paleologos, Constantine Diacozis, uh, then sent letter by envoy to Murad II, a.k.a. Amarath, the Turkish Sultan to rule in order to rule Byzantium by permission of the Ottomans. The reason for this is because the other of John's brothers, Demetrius Paleologos, had the support of 
both the Orthodox and Catholic churches. This point is extremely important because Constantine Dracozis did not send the envoy to Rome, where popes for centuries claimed the right to grant to men crowns and authority to rule for fear that the decision would go against him. And so he obtained his authority to rule from the Ottomans, right? So the four Turkish sultans. His coronation occurred without his being crowned by the Orthodox patriarch Gregory III, an ecumenical leader who favored union with the Holy See. If Constantine had obtained permission from, from Pope Nicholas V and had been crowned by the patriarch Gregory III, then he might quickly defer to James White's conclusion that the papacy is the king of the north. But Constantine turned to the Muslim power to obtain his authority to rule. Therefore, we can only conclude that the Ottoman Muslims would be the next king of the north upon Constantine's death when Muhammad II would capture Constantinople only four years later. Okay, so this is um, kind of an interesting idea. So what he's saying is that when we have the fall of Eastern Rome, it's connected with the last Roman emperor, right? Constantine XI, Dracozis, submitting to the four Turkish sultans. And, and for that reason, then, they become the king of the north. Islam becomes the king of the north or Turkey becomes the king of the north. Okay. So that's a very different idea than, than anything Uriah Smith presents. Right. So this is not a Uriah Smith argument. This is an argument by, by Thiel. So what do we think of this? I mean, it's quite a different idea. It'd be nice if he had, you know, presented this sort of argument without all of this other stuff. You know, all I think of this. he's reaching. He, he is truly reaching to support his premise. Now, it's a good, good idea, yes. But yeah, how how can this be said to be affecting the situation of all nations. I mean, we're, we're looking strictly at this with Eastern Rome, that Eastern Rome, which is at this point soon to disappear from the world stage, is not fully in control of three geographical areas as we have presented and has been presented multiple times in the past. Right. So, so, so it, it's, it's an intriguing little idea. Right. But, but there are some major problems. So one is we know that the papacy is the power that arises here. Right. Agreed. Right. So the papacy has, has already been there. Right. So we know the papacy was there in the sixth century at the time that Islam arose. Right. You know, they're sort of papacies a bit earlier. But, uh, you know, because we're going to have uh, Muhammad in whatever that year is, um, you know, his flight is going to be 622, right? We have the papacy in 538. So, like, you know, 100 years earlier, before Islam exists, the papacy is already in place. Now, when we're dealing here with, with Turkey later, right, 1449, we would say already that that Rome has been the king of the north, right? Rome conquered uh, that whole area, right? The Roman Empire. And the papacy has already arisen. Now we could say, well, the papacy arose in the west, right? So what he's arguing is that the papacy is in the west, but this is a kingdom in the east, right? And so so he's going to argue that this this kingdom arises, Turkey that becomes the king of the north rather than the papacy being the king of the north. But if we look at what's in Revelation, do we see Islam taking that position? I don't see it. Yeah, I mean, I don't see it. I, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a clever sort of argument, but it, it it doesn't stand when we look at everything. Now, to, to say it's the king of the north, so so Uriah Smith's argument was basically since it's that territory, it has to stay to be stay the territory of the king of the north, right? So whoever has that territory is the king of the north, right? And since Turkey gets that territory, it becomes the king of the north. But 
But we also we also you know have to look at at other other lines and how they're connected. So James White, of course, is using this this broader idea that it's always Rome that comes to its end, right? The papacy, the beast comes to his end. Is, do we have in um, in Revelation where we see Turkey coming to its end? Or are we going to argue that, you know, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, that, you know, is, is he going to argue that that's not, that, that you know, uh, whether it's maybe it's the dragon power that's Turkey? I don't know. Um, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So so we see that Rome is that final kingdom. We don't see that in this interpretation of Daniel chapter 11. But, but this idea that we split Eastern and Western Rome and one becomes the beast and one becomes the king of the north, then you would have quite a different interpretation in Revelation. And, and I don't know what his interpretation of Revelation is, whether he follows Uriah Smith or, you know, something different. But um, but it, but it is kind of clever. I mean, it, it's it's kind of an interesting take. OK, so he says uh, the papacy never had never really had any civic authority over Byzantium. Four centuries earlier, we would note that Pope Gregory VII excommunicated and deposed kings for transgressions against the Holy See. Gregory VII would also set a precedent for organizing crusades against Muslim rulers by the examples he set in attempting to send a military expedition to rescue the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem because of the bungling of Constantine's military leaders, arguing that Western Christians should come to the aid of Eastern Christians. So, um, so obviously you know about the Crusades, right, against Islam. So why would Daniel record an explanation couched in a prophetic time period that can only describe the move from Rome to Constantinople unless God was introducing in Daniel that historical player further expanded upon in Revelation 9th, used by God to punish the apostate professors of Christianity? Okay, so what is that question asking? Is it suggesting that um, Islam is in Revelation chapter 9, therefore it should also be in Daniel? Okay, why? What's his reasoning? I've just come into the meeting, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, so yeah, you've missed quite a bit here. So so just to go back, so he he's he's dealing with James White's objection. And, and the way that he's doing this is he's saying that James White is missing out something, that in Revelation we have Islam, right, um, in, in Revelation 9. And that that since we have we have this in Revelation 9, we should also see it in Daniel, this move, movement of the capital from Rome to Constantinople and also the fall of Eastern Rome. Now, is, is that logical that Daniel has to have those details in Daniel chapter 11? Does he have to have those details? We know the revelation is an expansion of Daniel. Is there lots of things in Revelation that aren't in Daniel that we don't have any hint of? Yeah. Revelation is an ex- not only a, not a lot of things repeated, but also expanding expansion, more things not yeah. mentioned in Daniel. Yeah, like we do see, you know, uh, yeah, so we see pagan and papal Rome, for instance, in in the little horn of Daniel chapter 8, right? And then, of course, Daniel is, is going to deal with the daily and the abomination of desolation. So you're going to see pagan and papal Rome, right? But you're not going to see the 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 three divisions. You're not going to see the two horned beast uh, hinted at in Daniel. Other than we're going to see in Daniel 11 verse 40, in our understanding of it, that we're going to have the United States connected with these armies, right? The 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 horses and chariots and many ships, the economic and military power of the United States hinted at, but but not explicitly stated. We don't have the image to the beast. 
and all those types of things in Daniel chapter 11, right? So, so there are things in Revelation, details, that, I mean, if they're in Daniel chapter 11, they would be, um, they would be indistinguishable until you have Revelation to even notice them. Right. So Daniel is going to be bringing you to the time of the end, but it's not going to be giving you all the details of end time events. Revelation is going to add more details. Now, um, and Stephen, so in the previous paragraph, Thiel had, had made this argument that uh, the beast is Western Rome and the king of the north is Eastern Rome when, when it's conquered. Right. So the beast power would be basically the Germanic tribes coming. That's Revelation eight, where they come in, they conquer uh, Western Rome and they <coughs> create this the power that we call the beast, the papacy and all of that. But in Eastern Rome, it's going to be conquered by Islam. And so it retains this title of the king of the north. And so it, it's quite an interesting uh sort of theory, not something I'd ever seen in Uriah Smith. But uh, so he says, therefore, we can only conclude that the Ottoman Muslims would be the next king of the north upon Constantine's death when Muhammad II would capture Constantinople only four years later. So so that's why he can make an argument that the king of the north in Daniel 11, verse 40, is Turkey. Right. So it's a little bit different argument than Uriah Smith uses. Uriah Smith just generally says that the territory of of Syria is what makes you the king of the north. If you have that territory, then you're the king of the north. So Daniel has this prophetic time period that describes the the, the move from Rome to Constantinople. But that we need to have, uh, according to Theo, we need to have. What's expanded in Revelation 9, we need to have that placed in Daniel. So unless God had introduced this in Daniel, we shouldn't see it in Revelation. Is that also, what? Yeah, you also have um, in Revelation mentioning like the moon being darkened in the earthquake. And uh, Daniel doesn't mention them either. Mm hmm. No, there's lots, lots of things that Daniel doesn't address, but that are expanded in the Revelation. That is, the Revelation gives us details that aren't in Daniel. Yes. And, and the question is, could Daniel uh, not introduce Islam? Would that be consistent? Even though he's describing some of that same period of time, he doesn't mention Islam. He's saying, well, he had to have introduced it in Daniel. Because this time period is there, but we don't we don't see Islam. If we don't see Islam in Daniel, we shouldn't see it in Revelation. No, one doesn't follow the other. Yeah, okay. necessarily logically. Uh, yeah, no, I, no, no, because we can think of lots of examples of other things that aren't introduced in Daniel that are expanded upon in Revelation and 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 in prophetic time periods as well. Okay. Now, the other thing that we would have to ask in sort of in, in relation to that is um, when we deal with the time of the end, as we understand it in Daniel 11, verse 40, as being the, the power that comes against the king of the south being France, we have an example in Revelation that France is Sodom and Egypt, right? So we have France in the book of Revelation. Now, he would say, well, France is introduced in Daniel 11 as this atheistic power, right? So, so you know, he's he would be consistent in that sense. But then when we have the time of the end and the event, why would we have Egypt coming against France and Turkey coming against France as the event that marks the time of the end? rather than uh, France, the king of the south, coming against the papacy. You understand the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so he has an event, Smith does, and Theo does as well, that is, is marking the time of the end, but is not the event that marks the time of the end, 
right? Because we would say the event that marks the time of the end is the Pope being taken captive. And yet that's not going to be described in Daniel 11, verse 40, according to Smith. What's going right, to be described an... is, is, well, it's actually France coming against Egypt. So he's saying that the pushing is a, is a weak resistance against France. And then uh, Turkey coming against France like a whirlwind. Hmm. But but the event that marks the time of the end is the king of the south pushing at the king of the north, which is the papacy. That's the word push. Consistent. The What's word that? push. He's, the word push is he's saying slightly weak, resisting. Isn't the word weak push resistance quite weak isn't, resistance. isn't it quite a strong word? Yes, to, to it's the same word that when. Uh, when Medo Persia pushes in Daniel chapter eight, the ram pushes, right? Okay. Yeah, right. that's overtakes, not just slight resistance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The word, um, push is, uh, to push thrust gore, uh, to engage in thrusting to wage war, right? Uh, Nagash. To, to gore, to gore is in a bull's horn goring. Yeah, yeah. And that's pretty. Push thrust or gore pretty, pretty, with a horn. Powerful. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, and that's then, a mortal wound, something, isn't it? Well, yeah, it, it's definitely aggressive. It's not a weak resistance of, of like somebody coming against you and you just kind of trying to push them away. What was the weak resistance that he's referring to? Um, he's so. Talking? So Napoleon goes into into Egypt and um, Egypt fights against him. So it's actually France coming against Egypt. Egypt isn't even pushing against France. It's so right. It, it's right. So it's defending um, itself. Yeah, because yeah, because it's in Daniel Daniel eight four. Yeah. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward. So that's that's. That's the expansion of, of the Persian Empire is seen as pushing. So since Egypt couldn't have been pushing against France, when France was the one actually pushing against Egypt, if you wanted to do it that way, right? Right, seeking to expand it, France's territory. Not yeah, the other way around. Egypt's yeah. not trying to expand its territory, right? Well, but also, yeah. You do have enough history. They had landed in Egypt by the River Nile. I think they were around that area. And then the um, Egypt armies, the Mam Mamluks, yeah. then yeah. sought to come against, to attack the French who had arrived. Mm -hmm. And um, But there they were just no... Uh, no match whatsoever to the French armies. Right. Um, but, but, but getting it to your point uh, concerning the time of the end, we know that the papacy being removed is a, a huge subject in prophecy that it has mm. great consequence. Yeah. And uh, the Almighty the says the Pope, you know, being captivity mm -hmm. will be. If he makes captivity, will go into captivity post revelation. Mm -hmm. And while this year event is just like quite a minor war that's going on in the world, you know, there's, right. like there's so much other battles going on in the world. That's why would it focus just on this little, you know, a few 34 French people or whatever were killed and a few thousand Mamluks. You know, compared yeah. to the, the, in the scheme of things, it's just one you fit in with the wars and rumors of wars. It's nothing yeah. of any spiritual consequence. So right. to try to make that the subject of Daniel 11 verse 40 is um, quite a narrow or quite a pitiful almost view. I think yeah. you know, yeah. and having spiritual discernment. Is a it's a, a low level of spiritual discernment. Yeah, yeah, and 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 we would say too, um, you know, because like we're trying to look at this, you know, fairly. 
but we know Uriah Smith has this view. And, and we're also going to look at Ellen White's statements. You know, he's going to look at some of these statements about Uriah Smith and about the Eastern question. Uh, but at the time, you know, this was something that people were talking about. What was going to happen with Turkey? And so it wasn't something that was unique uh, to Adventism. It was something that was was commonly looked at. Now, you know, one of the arguments we have about Smith is that really he's he's sort of influenced by these Protestant commentators. That, that and he's using some of the same methods of study. So there's this whole study about the hermeneutics of Weir compared to Miller, and, and we don't see a difference. I don't see that Lewis F. Weir's you know, expansion or detailed description of the principles of prophetic interpretation differ from Miller's. They're the same principles. It's just, uh, you know, sort of delineated more clearly. Um, and definitely we don't see the mystical ideas that, that, uh, Thiel sort of tries to, uh, place upon Weir as opposed to Miller. <laughs> but um so when we look at smith looking at this history it might seem significant to him but ellen white's not going to mention this right so if it was a major part of this prophecy uh you would think that ellen white would have something to say about it as far as the time of the end is concerned so that that's that would be the other you know, the other thing is we, we can understand in a sense why Smith gets caught up in it. But James White isn't going to accept it. He's not going to buy into it. OK. So James White wants Rome, the beast cast into the fire, to be the king of the north because he concluded that the being cast into the fire is the fulfillment of he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Which we would agree with. But 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 Thiel says, but this conclusion is also flawed in its logic. So let's see how Thiel addresses this flaw in logic. Let us for a moment consider the whole passage concerning the beast being cast into the fire. The concept is taken from Revelation 19 and 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the, on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that received uh, the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for and ever and ever. Daniel depicts a power that meets its solitary end. None shall help him. But in Revelation, the beast does not meet its end in a solitary, completely helpless manner. These both, beast and false prophet, were cast alive into a lake into a lake of fire. Not only that, but the latter, the devil, is cast into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are. Because the devil deceived and helped them without lasting success. Furthermore, the end of the beast and the false prophet occurs after the time of trouble mentioned in Daniel 12, verse 1. But the language of Daniel indicates that the king of the north comes to his solitary end before Michael stands up. Okay, so there's some, some points here which we need to address. Lewis Weir either did not know of these important historical nuances in his defense of James White, or he did not care to make them prominent in his writings because they expose weaknesses. Rather, he begins his objections by stating, the Ottoman Empire in the past could not have been the king of the north, the Turkish Republic in the present could not be the king of the north. The facts of Turkish his history will not fit the prophetic mold. 
Just comparing this statement with the facts just previously presented demonstrates the inadequacy of Weir's conclusion. Rather than supplying the reader with historical facts that would support his conclusion, he relies upon other arguments to make it appear that Turkish history does not fit. We shall attempt to understand the weaknesses of his arguments in their order. Okay, so before we look at those weaknesses of the arguments, has Steele given a good argument at this point regarding what James White says about coming to his end? Uh, for instance, do we believe that Daniel 11 verse 45 is, is occurring before the close of probation? Well, Daniel 12 verse 1 says at that time, so it's referring to the previous verses. Okay. So it's in amongst, so it's within that period of verse 44, 45. Okay. Now when it says, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, when does that occur? What What is that event? That's uh, like a church and state relationship. Okay, so, so it's the pap we understand it to be the papacy, right? Between God's people, the glorious holy mountain, and the seas, right? The other people. Right? We don't take this literally as, as dealing with the land of Palestine. Okay. So how do we understand? That's the papacy with the Sunday law in the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's going to be the whole issue of the Sunday law, right? Now, this includes all of the Sunday law, stuff that happens before the close of probation and stuff that happens after. But when it says, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him, does that mean that that occurs prior to the close of probation? Or is that just f referring to the ultimate end? of this power the ultimate end that, that would be the ultimate end so that means that last part of the verse does not occur prior to the close of probation in the way that we understand it right so so we don't have to take it that because this is mentioned here in verse 45 that that means he comes to his end prior to michael standing up we would actually look at Thus shall he come to his end. The Daniel 12 is actually an expansion of how he comes to his end, right? The Daniel is written still in this repeat and enlarge idea, still written like the Jews write. So you can't make the mistake of saying, because he's, it says, he, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And then at that time shall Michael stand up, that that means that that him coming to his end occurs before Michael standing up, right? Okay. Now, now the other the other point is that there are other powers that come to their end. So, what are these other powers? The beast and the false prophet are either of these Turkey? No. No. Okay. So, so it's kind of irrelevant. <laughs> Um, it's an irrelevant argument. It, 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 I mean, if he was arguing that the false prophet was Turkey, then he could have something where we say, well, Turkey coming to its end is part of a biblical prophecy in the book of Revelation, right? So, so obviously we know that it's not just the beast that comes to his end. Uh, we know it's the false prophet comes to his end as well. Okay. Well, I don't and think then, that's the argument he's making. Okay, what's the argument he's making then? So he's taking James White's position. Who and, is? Um, well, he's he's focusing on it. Theo. Yeah, so he's okay, focusing upon James White's position that the one that comes to his end must be the papacy in Daniel 11, verse 45, and none to yes. help him. So yeah. it's sort of saying... It just says the papacy comes to the end. It's not saying the papacy and the armies of the papacy are something else. It's just right. focusing on one. Right. And then he's, he's, his argument then is here in Revelation, it's the papacy and the false prophet. So I think it's, uh, he's saying it's because it's, you see him just one come to its end, 
in Daniel 11? Well, that it, can't, that it can't be the beast and the false prophet. It would have to be some other power. Yeah, the, he's sort of saying, suggesting, well, there should be two coming to their end in Daniel 11 if it was just going to be the papacy. Oh, okay. I think so, that's so, so he says it's Turkey coming to its end in Daniel 11 because it only mentions one. That's his argument. Okay, well, okay. Well, is that a good argument? I don't think has, so. has Daniel introduced two powers that come to their end? Right, so, so if we take our position, our position is that it's just addressing uh, Rome, the papacy coming to his end. But in the Revelation, it's going to expand on that and show that there are two powers, the, the, the beast and the image to the beast, right? The United States making an image to the beast. Yes. So would we expect that Daniel would have to mention both of those powers coming to their end, even though he hasn't introduced the other one? I would not expect that. Yeah. So so either way you look at it, this this argument is not, not a good argument. Now, now, since he has Western Rome being the beast and Eastern Rome becoming the king of the north, I would think that in the Revelation, he would have to have Turkey as being one of those three powers. So that to me would be more logically consistent. Like if he took the position that the false prophet was Islam, then that would make sense. Or maybe the dragon power being Islam or something like that. Right. If he's going to have Turkey have such a role in end time prophecy. I mean, if Turkey is going to make its capital Jerusalem uh, before Christ returns, it, it would need to be more more expanded on in Revelation than just being uh, Revelation 9. Right? Does that make sense? I would be, yeah, I think I think I would say you would like to see it there. If it's mentioned in the Turkey at the end in uh, Daniel 11, as a, yeah. a major subject in prophecy, yeah. I would expect it to be a significant part of the end time events. Right. Uh, now, right now we at do the see, end of the world. Yeah, and now we do see Islam. So the, the first and second world we know are Islam. And and then we know that the third woe is Islam. So Islam does have a role to play, but it's not the major power, right? It's not it's not one of the beasts, it's not the beast, it's not one of those parts of Babylon that that comes to its end. Because the purpose of Islam is it's it's there to protect God's people from the Sunday law. That that's the role it had historically. And that's the role that it played at 9-11, right? Which we will understand, you know, more fully as time goes on. But Well, maybe more of a judgment against Rome. Well, a judgment against Rome, yeah. But, but it also did, I mean, we've taken the position that, that a Sunday law would have happened sooner if it wasn't for Islam coming against 9-11. Whether we can prove that or not, I don't know. But that's a position that we've taken. That a Sunday law was in the works, 9-11 created some problems. Now, of course, it's it's changed the world so that, you know, how how the Sunday law would come about would be quite different in our history. But but those are always what ifs, which are difficult things to answer. Uh, but I, I think it's a bit unfair here when he says um, Lewis F. F. Weir, and, and we'll come to this tomorrow in more detail, but he says that he did not know of these important historical nuances in his defense of James White. And I don't think these are historical nuances at all, right? Or he did not care to make them prominent in his writings because they expose weaknesses. Well, I don't, I don't think that that's at all what Lewis F. Weir's motives are. Uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I, I just don't follow the logic here. So I have a hard time with Theo's logic, with the way that he reasons. Um, you know, so he's probably a little bit different than me in how he reasons things through. But I wouldn't say that that Weir is trying to uh, pull the wool over our eyes in how he's presenting his argument. He's trying to either, you know, 
he's either ignorant of these things because I don't think he is. I mean, you think he's quite, quite aware of, of both of these arguments. So to say, you know, that he comes to a solitary and it, it, it doesn't really follow that because I don't think Weir would have even considered these arguments as, as, as strengths. <laughs> Uh, for Uriah Smith, because I don't think Uriah Smith even even makes these arguments, right? So I don't see these arguments in Smith. So why would Weir, in support of James White, you know, hide these arguments that he doesn't know about and that really don't even make sense? So he says, rather, he begins his objections by stating the Ottoman Empire in the past could not have been the king of the north. The Turkish Republic in the present could not be the king of the north. The fact of Turkish history will not fit the prophetic mold. Now, so say just comparing this statement with the facts just previously presented demonstrates the inac- inadequacy of Weir's conclusion. Now, is this Weir's conclusion or is this where he begins his objections? So obviously this is not all that Weir says about the topic, topic right? Rather than supplying the reader with historical facts that would support his conclusion, which I don't, I agree that he actually he does. So he relies upon other arguments to make it appear that Turkish history does not fit. So he's going to look at those and then we're going to start looking at those, um, uh, tomorrow, right? What these arguments of Weir are. Now, I'm, I'm not usually very satisfied with how, with, with the quotes that Weir picks, or not Weir, Thiel picks uh, regarding Weir, right? So he hasn't quoted very often from Lewis F. Weir. Um, and when he does quote, he he likes to pick things that he can pick at rather than looking at all of Weir's arguments. So we're going to take a bit of time. It might take us a couple of studies to go through all of this. But we're going to go through Weir's paper as well and see what Weir actually says and what his arguments are, because his arguments are very solid. But uh, anyway, a- any final thoughts uh, before we close? Uh, hopefully this was interesting. It, it's a little slow, but uh, I think there are details that we have to address. Now, Stephen, you might have to watch uh, the video over parts you missed. Okay, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. I pray that you can bless each person, watch over them, bring us together again to study your word. And um, I thank you for all the things you're doing in our lives. Help us to trust fully in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.